Hello and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be talking about insecure design in our web application, which according to OWASP is the fourth most common vulnerability that we see out there in the wild. In this video, I'm going to discuss exactly what it is. We'll look at some examples, including how an infinite money loop was created because of insecure design. And we'll also talk about preventative measures. Before we get going, quickly give this video a quick thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. We're fairly new, but we're trying to make great security content for developers. So please subscribe to the channel if that sounds like something you're interested in. And if it's not, then do it anyway, because, well, you're here. All right, let's get into the video. Insecure design, what is it? Fundamentally, it's slightly different to most other vulnerabilities that we see. And this is because other vulnerabilities really revolve around insecure implementation. For example, an injection vulnerability is the insecure implementation of taking user data and allowing it to interact with our different systems. There are some very concrete examples of what we can do to explain this. And we'll start off with business logic flaws, right? Insecure design via business logic flaws. There's a silly example that I'm going to start with. However, there is actually kind of a real world equivalent of this silly example. So it's, it's less silly than you may think hearing it. All right. Let's say that we have a banking application. And in this case, we have two users, Alice and Bob. Alice wants to send Bob 20 bucks. Lucky day for Bob. So Alice goes through this process. She makes a request from her bank that may be done via an API, right? That API checks that Alice does indeed have this $20 that she wants to send. So that she therefore process that request and they send that $20 to Bob. Now let's implement a business logic flaw here. What if Alice sends negative $20 to Bob? Does that then credit Alice? And deduct from Bob? Is that a way of kind of forcing a withdrawal of money from other people? Does it crash? What happens, right? Now, again, I said that this sounds silly and I'm sure you're thinking that it does. If you're designing a bank, you wouldn't allow that to happen. Well, let's talk about a scenario where that actually did happen. The scenario that I'm talking about happened to Coinbase, a cryptocurrency exchange, and it happened, it was discovered in 2022 and it existed pretty much from 2013 when it was launched to 2022. I'm going to use the same two people to describe the scenario here. We have Alice and Bob and Alice wants to send Bob to Bitcoin, which is a lucky day for Bob because I think that's like over a hundred grand worth of value. Inside Alice's account, let's say that she has a total of five Bitcoin and 10 Ethereum. What's important to know in this scenario is that Bitcoin is valued at 20 to 30 times more than Ethereum. So Alice makes this request. She puts in a request to send two Bitcoin to Bob. That goes to the API. The API then does a whole bunch of validation to make sure before running the exchange that Alice yet in fact does have enough money. So they calculate how many coins Alice has. And I said Alice has five Bitcoin and 10 Ethereum coin, which means Alice has 15 coins and she's trying to send two. Alice absolutely has enough money. It sends the Bitcoin to Bob. Did you spot the insecure design of that? The system didn't check how many Bitcoin Alice had. The system checked how many coins Alice have. So let's say that there's another scenario here. Let's say that Alice doesn't in fact have any Bitcoin. She only has 10 Ethereum, but she needs to send two Bitcoin to Bob, but she doesn't have enough money. So what she does is she sniffs out the API endpoint of Coinbase. She crafts her own API request and says, hey, I want to send two Bitcoins to Bob. So she fires off and does that. The validation kicks in and it checks to see, does Alice have two coins? And Alice does. She has 10. They're of Ethereum, a different currency. The system's not checking for that. The system's checking how many coins she has. Therefore, the two Bitcoin are sent to Bob. And now Alice has eight Ethereum, but she's just sent a whole lot more value than that. Now, so far, as I said, we've talked about business logic flaws and insecure design. And the examples that I give are pretty hyperbolic, right? They're pretty business destroying, <laughs> creating infinite money. They're not always like that. And insecure design often has a lot of vulnerabilities that are smaller, but can also be almost just as devastating. A common example may be sensitive information that's been exposed in error messages. Sometimes we forget who we're designing certain systems for. Sometimes we insecurely design these error messages to expose way more information than what a user needs. 
Another area of insecure design is having an overexposed attack surface. This often comes down a lot with a couple of reasons. One, you have legacy systems that you haven't gotten rid of that sit out there that can still be used. Another area is maybe you have certain systems that developers use internally. Right? Often, we put in backdoors into our application, so if something goes wrong, we can very quickly manipulate a database, connect to internal systems, shut down things, <laughs> do a lot of scary stuff. Often, we build tools to do this, but we forget, hey, this is part of our main application if it's able to interact with it and it's sitting in public. Therefore, if an attacker finds it, this is a very insecure way of designing our application. Another vulnerability that we often see with insecure design is not logging and monitoring all the activity appropriately. So if an attack is going on, often there'll be signs in the logs when you have lots of attempts at certain systems or lots of data coming through. You should be logging all this information so that you can uncover it when an attack is happening. Failure to do so is a design flaw in your system. Now, just between me and you and everyone on the internet, Insecure design can be a little bit ambiguous as to what exactly to put inside this box as opposed to another, another box. And whilst I generally love the OS Top 10, I find this category a little bit confusing when we're trying to determine certain things. For example, when we talked about cryptographic failures, we talked about making sure that we encrypt our information. Not encrypting our information in transit, for example, when we're sending our information across, gives us exposure to a man-in-the-middle attack. Is this a design flaw or a cryptographic flaw? Well, actually, it's both, right? Because we've designed the system in that way, but we're not correctly encrypting data, so therefore it falls under both. What about prevention? How do we prevent business logic vulnerabilities? The first one is kind of simple to talk about. It's making sure that we're using valid frameworks to build our applications on, right? Standing on the top of giants. There's a great bunch of open source frameworks that we can use to build our applications. When we use these and we don't try and reinvent the wheel, then often these will have built-in logic safeguards that will help us design a secure application. The second thing that I always recommend, and I actually is one of my favorite activities, is to make sure that you do threat modeling regularly, especially when you make big changes. Threat modeling is all about laying out all of your attack surface, all the different systems, microsystems, API endpoints that your application is using, and then trying to figure out how an attacker will target each one. Now, there's some great frameworks to help you get started on this. One of the most popular is called STRIDE. It stands for spoofing, tampering, reputation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privileges. The idea of Stride is that once we've mapped out our entire system, all of our assets, all of our endpoints, then on each one, we will apply the Stride model. Can someone spoof this? How can they tamper with it? With reputation, how can they do something malicious but no one find out about it, right? It's a lot of fun because you can come up with weird scenarios and I can guarantee that you'll come up with ways that someone could maliciously attack your application. There's also other frameworks that you can use for threat modeling. The MITRE attack framework is a great one. This is a little bit more in depth. If you're new to threat modeling, the MITRE attack might be a great way to start because it also prompts you to try and discover all of the assets that you could have, right? It guides you through the reconnaissance phase and an attacker would. And then at every step you move through from that initial access, elevating their privileges, and then ultimately launching their attacks in different areas. There's a lot of different examples and you can kind of link some together to try and formulate an attack. The attack framework on the downside is quite intense when you see it all out there. So it can put some people off, but these are meant to be great fun exercises, but they also can be extremely valuable. I would also still always recommend implement tools like SAST, Static Application Security Testing, Dynamic Application Security Testing. They're probably not going to catch your business logic flaws, but if you're interested in securing your app, they should also still be a great part of it. And if you want an all-in-one solution that help you get security done, then you can check out the free version of Keto, which will even give you a great OWASP report of how you're doing in the top 10 over your applications. I hope you enjoyed this video and make sure you subscribe to the channel to hear about our next video, which will be security misconfigurations. We're gonna dive into some areas in the cloud space. Mm, should be interesting. Make sure you stick around for that and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks.